pulsing. Welcome everybody to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So we're going to be um, studying this chapter today, but let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, in Jesus' name we come before you, and we thank you that we are accepted in your beloved Son. And we thank you that you are forming the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace, and we pray that you would add to the body of Christ, that many people will come to trust that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and be saved and added to the body. And we pray that many in the body of Christ will come to the knowledge of the truth and understand the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul and to be able to share this truth um, about the dispensation of grace with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, thank you for your word. <laughs> All right, so um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to have a frank and candid and personal look concerning marriage. And um, the chapter is broken down in this way. Verses 1 through 9, it is better to marry than to burn. Then in uh, 10 through 24, marriage between believers and unbelievers. Then in um, 25 to 40, advice to the unmarried and their parents. And um, I love the modest um, language of the King James Bible. And so we're going to be modest today too. And so the Corinthians had some questions, but before we go there, I want to uh, correct a mistake that I made last week. And that was that um, we're not going to be judging the fallen angels. We are actually going to be judging the holy angels. And um, so they, because Paul says in, um, the last verse in chapter 5, verse 513, that God, uh, those without God will judge. So that means those that are without faith, both men and uh, mankind and angels that are without faith in what God says. So then when he goes into um, chapter 6, He's actually saying that we will judge the holy angels in ages to come. And the holy angels, um, when it says judge, it means that we will rule or have authority over them. They will be ministering to us and serving us and helping us. Mm. So the word judge is more like ruling. Just like in Matthew 19, 28, where um, the Lord Jesus Christ said to the little flock that they're going to be judging the 12 tribes. You know, the, the 12 apostles are going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel with the Lord. And so when that means rule along with the Lord. So we're going to be, um, you know, ruling over the the good angels, and um, I learned this by listening to a YouTube video of a three-part message that Brian Ross had on this verse, um, Know ye not that ye will judge angels, and that's um, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, and also Pastor John Verstegen on Sunday when he did his message on Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 also talked about this verse. So I have been corrected, and when we realize that we've made a mistake, what do we do? We admit to the fact that we made a mistake, and we, you know, tell people what our mistakes were us, and there, then we can correct it. Because there is not one grace pastor or grace teacher that I know that has not made a mistake. We all make mistakes. We are human. But let God be true and every man a liar. 
God's word is perfect and wherever a human being differs from the word of God, the King James Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So the King James Bible is always right, but we may um, be in error. So I hope that you know you will forgive me of this error and still want to continue learning from these studies. So um, let us quickly summarize um, chapter 6. So in chapter 6, uh, Paul says, Why do you go to court about church matters before unbelievers when they are doing the same things that you used to do? They are like you were before you were saved. So why, you know, not take care of your own disputes? So that's kind of chapter 6 in a sentence. Or quickly summarize. So chapter 6 ends the part where he's reproving them for certain, on certain issues. So then in chapter 7, Paul begins to answer some of the questions that the Corinthians had. So um, now there, some of their questions was, um, some were saved after marriage. What should they do? Should they leave an unsaved spouse? What if the unsaved spouse wants to end the marriage? Paul says, stay where you are in the marriage and use every opportunity to win your lost mate. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on further in this chapter. He will say, stay where you are in that physical condition that you're in. And then he'll say, stay in your job or socioeconomic state that you're called in. And then he'll finally end the chapter with advice for the unmarried. He uses the word called in this chapter nine times. So nine is, of course, the, the number for the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So let me put this over here. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the timeline. So um, when, before Paul was called, then, oh, don't, don't zero in, Patty. So, um, the nation of Israel um, was considered by God a, a vessel of honor. And he always had a believing remnant. So, the, it was really the remnant that was in honor. But he also gave preferential treatment to the nation of Israel. Then, they fell at the stoning of Stephen. And Paul um, and, uh, uh, says in Romans 11:11, 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? So they stumbled at the cross, and they fell at the stoning of Stephen. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come for, uh, uh, unto the Gentiles, which means all nations. The opportunity for salvation has come to all nations. And um, for to provoke them to jealousy, to provoke the, the, the nation of Israel to jealousy. So the nation has fallen, and the nation is in dishonor right now. So God is going to all nations. So even today, the nation of Israel is considered like the Gentiles, because there's no preferred um, nation status at this time. Mm -hmm during the time of Romans to Philemon. Those are the, the f complete doctrine for the dispensation of grace to the body of Christ. But after the rapture, then there will be, uh, they will return to having a separation between um, Israel, the circumcision, and the uncircumcision. Because, um, well, the shout of the archangel at, at the rapture, that really is a shout to let Israel know that the program has started back with them now. 
So, because Michael the Archangel is, his, um, you know, he is, represents that nation. So then they'll be, um, the circumcision will be in a preferred nation status, and there'll be a remnant of honor during the tribulation. And then um, after the second coming and the resurrection of the kingdom saints, then the nation will be 100% honor uh, during that 1,000 year reign, because they'll have the new covenant and um, there'll be a nation of priests. There's no, no priests today that, you know, as far as God is concerned, there's no priests like the nation of Israel will be that's between the Lord Jesus Christ, the King, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Today we have pastors and teachers. So let's um, take, uh, begin chapter 7 now. Patty, if you'll mm -hmm. please help us to read um, chapter 7, verse 1. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Let me, let me make sure that I have and don't have something I need to say. Okay, so I just... Uh, is the camera pointing to me now? Uh, you're a little bit low uh, if, on okay. the screen. Should okay. I... Un, uh, no, it just, I yeah, just kind of okay. turn oh, it okay. here. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay, right. good. I just want them to be able to see. Uh -huh. So the life of a grace believer mm -hmm. is about Christ and what he's done and not about us. Hmm. So the, the angels are watching and learning from us right now. So we should behave soberly, circumspectly, and respectfully. Patty, I think you should turn it just a little bit more towards me. Okay. okay. Um, so I've also cor made the correction of my mistake. In the, my last, in the post with the three heavens, um, that's on God's Secret Facebook page, oh. corrected now, okay. and on my wall also, um, Facebook. Okay, so let's get into chapter seven. So the theme of chapter seven is about marriage okay. and um, staying where you are. I'm a retired um, re uh, registered nurse and a certified nurse midwife and who helped deliver babies for 35 years in hospitals, birth centers, and homes. And I also have a degree in clinical psychology. During my last 23 years as a midwife, I was the owner and operator of Christian Midwife Home Birth Service. So um, during that ministry, I taught women to love their husbands and their children. Um, for so, I and then I have been saved and studying the Bible for almost thirty years. But it was not until I came to rightly divide the Word of Truth that I learned about true liberty, deep joy, and real clarity of God's Word. And I want everyone to have this freedom. So please don't be surprised when you study chapter 7 if, um, if it's very frank, candid, and personal discussion, because Paul was very candid. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, um, so let's, um, let me just say that because um, we are... God's not dealing with the nation now, but that they are, we are living in Israel's blindness. Replacement theology and covenant theology, both are false doctrine. Because today God is forming the new creature, the body of Christ, the one new man. Mm -hmm. And the middle wall of partition, like we said, between circumcision and uncircumcision is down. So today there is no difference or distinction in the body of Christ between Jews and Gentiles. But Jews can be saved today individually, but the nation is on hold until after the rapture. So Israel as a nation is now in apostasy or lo ami, not my people, and not God's preferred nation. So we are called mid-acts dispensationalists. So, 
um, mid-Acts means that we believe that God says that the body of Christ began in Acts 9 with Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus. Um, and Christ revealed his plan to populate the heavenly places because in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and he is going to now have a group of people to live in heaven and he gave this revelation to Paul progressively. So now we're ready, Patty. Okay. Now you can go to chap uh, chapter 7, verse 1. All right, I like that intro. Okay, um, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, so he's saying now I'm going to start answering the questions that you wrote to me about. So one of the reasons why he says it is good for a man not to touch a woman is that Paul was celibate so that he could devote himself completely to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ and not, you know, drag a, a woman through all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And he could concentrate on God and not on his wife. Um, let's... Let me read verse 2. So when he says not touch, not touch a woman, he means, you know, to be single. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So, um, marriage can help a husband and wife avoid fornication because their intimate needs are fulfilled in the marriage. The only real motive for marriage should be love, not sex, but love. Part of the duty of the husband and wife is to give themselves to intimate relations with one another. We don't have Maureen with us today because she had to get her car fixed. So, Patty, could you please read verse 3? Okay. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So, we're going to do good and bring joy to our, our um, uh, uh, you know, spouses. The wife, this is verse 4, hath no power over her own body but the husband, and likewise, also, the husband has no power over his own body, but the wife. So, the husband's body belongs to the wife, and the wife's body belongs to the husband. We are not to practice self-gratification, if you understand what I mean. But gratification within the confines of marriage. Paul clearly teaches monogamy between one husband and one wife. Furthermore, it was important for husbands to be satisfied at home and not to run up to the temple of Aphrodite on top of the mountain overlooking the city of Corinth with its thousand temple prostitutes. That, um, so, verse 5, Patty? Defraud ye not one of the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Okay, so withholding intimate relations is a type of defrauding of the spouse, unless done with, by mutual consent for a short time of prayer and fasting, but then come together again so that Satan can't tempt you um, from seeking satisfaction elsewhere. Incontinency means not able to contain yourself. In verse 6, oh, these glasses are a little foggy, but that's okay. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So Paul is, says, I'm telling you this by permission from Christ, not by his commandment. Verse 7, Patty. For I wouldn't. I would allow. For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. 
So Paul wishes that everyone had the gift of celibacy. Paul may have been married at one time, since he probably was a member of the Sanhedrin, because he says in Acts 26.10 that he cast his vote against the believers in the little flock. So, you know, he was probably one of those in that group that was able to put a vote. Um, so, um, marriage was a requirement for the Sanhedrin, being a member of Sanhedrin. But he is celibate now, so he might have become a widow. And Paul says, I have the gift of celibacy, but I know that everyone has different gifts. So, it was okay with Paul to stay that way. Uh, verse 8 says, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them to, if they abide even as I. So, he might have been a widow, see? Mm -hmm. Verse 9, Patty? But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Okay. So that's a real important little verse right there. Because we're going to run into this better to marry than to burn. A little later on we talk about virgins. So keep that in your mind. Verse 10 says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let the wife depart from... Let the wife, let not. let not, I'm sorry, let not the wife depart from her husband. Um, verse 11 says, but, and if she, so the husband, so the Lord Jesus Christ says, let not the wife depart from her husband. Let her stay where she are, is, even, you know, if one is not saved. Then verse 11 says, but, and if she depart, since, Paul wants to be gracious because we're under grace right now. So, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So the husband's not supposed to put away his wife either, whether she's saved or unsaved. So, if someone has the desire for intimate relations and a life partner, let them marry. That is not a sin. The Lord told Paul that a wife should not depart from her husband, but if she leaves for a while, she should not marry during that time of separation, but go back to her husband. Paul is permitting, not commanding, separation. A husband is not to put away his wife. We are not under the law, but under grace. That's in Romans 6.14. So, Patty, verse 12. But to the rest... Speak I not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to, to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Okay, so now um, Paul is saying that, um, uh, that he's talking and not the Lord. Mm -hmm. So if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, so if a saved man has an unbelieving wife and she want, wants to live with him, let him not put her away. Verse 13 says, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if she be pleased to dwell with her, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So stay mm -hmm. You know, for the believing wife, she's supposed to stay with her unbelieving husband if he's, you know, if he wants to stay in the marriage. Uh, Patty, verse 14. The, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Okay, so... What he's saying there is that the unbelieving husband and children have an opportunity to be saved because of the they can observe the believing spouse and and, and parent, and so um, that's how they are sanctified. There, they have an opportunity for salvation. Verse fifteen. 
But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Okay, so if someone wants to depart from the marriage, um, then we're going to find out that um, uh, we're going to learn more about that in just a minute. But I want to read the next verse before I talk about that. So we're supposed to have, remain in peace in the marriage between the uh, believing spouse and unbelieving spouse. We're supposed to maintain peace. Verse 16, Patty. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Okay. So the husband and wives of the unbelievers should remain with the unsaved partners and do their best to win them to Christ. We are to live in peace with them. And I heard um, DJ Kennedy, who is not a grace pastor, but he's a pastor, say that he led his wife to the Lord because he did not presume that she was saved, even though she was in the church choir and did many, you know, Christian church type things. And so, um, we have to ask our spouses what they are trusting in to get them into heaven. If it's not in Christ alone, then they are not saved. The partner and the children are sanctified by the believer because through them they have the opportunity to be saved by observing the believer. We said that. But if the unbeliever leaves, then abandonment breaks the marriage relationship and gives the partner a chance for divorce and remarriage. So, um, because Paul said that we're not under bondage in such cases. Um, verse 17, Patty. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Okay, so this is uh, a time when Paul uses the word called. Uh, the Lord hath called everyone. You know, that's meaning when, you know, when you're saved. When you were saved, you're supposed to stay where you are and walk in the place. And kind of like bloom where you're planted type thing. Mm -hmm. And he tells everyone in his churches to do the same thing. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. So, remain in the physical condi condition you are in when you're called or saved. I know that some uh, graced pastors or teachers will say that this refers to the bo uh, little flock in the body of Christ, but I think that it, uh, it actually has to do with the physical condition of the people, whether they're circumcised when they were saved or uncircumcised when they're saved. So circumcision is nothing today because the cross work of Christ is everything. So let's look at Galatians 2, 3. Turn to Galatians 2, 3, and then we're going to look in Galatians 5, 1 through 6. Uh, Patty, why don't you read Galatians 2, 3, and I'll read the other. Okay, Galatians 2, 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So when um, Paul went to Jerusalem with Titus, no one there compelled him to be circumcised. And he, you know, he remained uncircumcised. So then, <clears throat> and that was the issue that brought Paul to the Jerusalem Council to discuss, you know, uh, whether or not Gentiles needed to be circumcised. And the final outcome was, no, they don't. So um, in Galatians 5, 1 through 6, Paul says, 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, the yoke of legalism. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of none, no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So if a man, um, you know, thinks that he's going to be more acceptable in the eyes of God, if he cuts off his foreskin, he's wrong. Because he's not going to be more acceptable. He's fallen from grace if he thinks that he can do something to it uh, um, to keep by keeping the law that will um, earn him points with God because God wants us to walk by faith not by sight verse 5 for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith see we're supposed to do walk by faith for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So we we walk by faith because we are love God and we're grateful to God for all that He has done for us on the cross. And by sending His Son, sparing not His own Son, right? Yes. So, um, we contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary, as Jonathan Edwards said. There is no distinction in the body of Christ among believers between a Jew and a Gentile. We are all one in Christ. Since we're in Galatians, Patty, can you read 328? <laughs> There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So, in the body of Christ, no one is any better and no one is any different than anyone else. We just exalt the Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done and everyone else are pretty much, you know, the ground is equal at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. So, I believe that Paul is saying that just like the color of someone's skin, okay, doesn't matter in the body of Christ, in marriage, neither does their religious background. Mm. So not, as, not only is he saying, you know, don't change physically, but I think he's alluding to the fact that, you know, we're all one in, in the body of Christ. Mm. So all that matters is that they trusted Christ for their salvation. So we can have marriage among believers. Um, so we are all made of one blood, as it says in Acts seventeen twenty six. And in Israel's circum uh, program, circumcision did matter. God was mad at Moses for not having his son circumcised in Exodus 4.25. Today, Israel is not a preferred nation, and the middle wall partition is down, which is what it says in Ephesians 2.14. Let's turn that there, Patty. Ephesians 2.14. Ephesians 2.14. Go ahead. For he is our peace. Who hath broke made both one, and hath broken uh, down the middle wall of partition between us. Okay, so the the separation between circumcision and uncircumcision has been removed. Oh. Mm -hmm. Israel of today is an apostasy, not believing in their Messiah, but after the rapture, God will resume His dealings with Israel. Today, both Jews and Gentiles are saved by believing the same good news, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Today, to be water baptized or physically circumcised is a sign of unbelief. 
in what God is doing. Our baptism and circumcision are both spiritual and take place the moment we believe. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We're, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 before we know it. Um, let me read that one. And then, Patty, you're, you're going to go to Colossians 2, 9 through 15. You get to read that whole section. 9, 2 through... Colossians 2, 9 through 15. Okay, but I'll read um, uh, Corinthians 12, 13 right now. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So bear with me as far as, you know, marriage with a Jew, between Jews and Gentiles right now, because by the time we finish this chapter, you'll see it more clearly. So just... Be patient. Um, so here we go. It's a, it's a spiritual baptism into the body of Christ. By the Spirit, we're baptized into one body, the body of Christ. So, um, Patty, Colossians 2, 9 through 15. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins, of the sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, all the oh, way to 15. Fifth. Okay, oh. let me read the next three. Okay. And you being dead in your sins and the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made it show of them openly, triumphing over them. So the circumcision is spiritual, and it's a circumcision that cuts between our body and our soul to, to re, you know, free us from the power of the sin nature over um, our souls. So mm -hmm. it is a spiritual circumcision that we have, mm -hmm. and um, our sins were you know, nailed to the cross um, and left there. <laughs> kind of like dead piece of foreskin. <laughs> okay, um, let's go on. Um, since we can't feel this uh, spiritual baptism or circumcision, we have to accept it by faith in what the Bible says. And when we identify with Christ's death and resurrection through faith, God performs the operation without hands. And circumcises, or you know, makes that, uh, the, or cuts the connection between the soul and the body, freeing us from the power of the flesh. The flesh, na fleshly nature, was rendered dead and powerless. So, if the believer sins now, he does so by choice. God made us spiritually alive with Christ, forgiving us all trespasses. When I read in um, 2.13, it says, forgiving you all trespasses. So mm -hmm. all our sins that we've done in the past, mm -hmm. that we're doing right now, and that we will do in the future, they've all been paid for mm -hmm. by the blood of Jesus Christ. He blotted out all our sins that we had committed, all the wrong things that we have done against God. Mm -hmm. He took them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. Notice that Christ in whom the Godhead dwelt bodily, spoiled or plundered, or took us back from Satan and his devils. Jesus was victorious and triumphed over Satan, openly shaming Satan and his cohorts with one gigantic, costly sacrifice of obedience to the Father, demonstrating the manifold wisdom of God. Jews and Gentiles can marry in the Lord, in this age.
So turn to Colossians 3.11. We're here in Colossians. 3.11. And Patty, just turn the page and read that 3.11. Where there is neither Jew or Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, Scythian, oh, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have, uh, we're one. We're one in the body of Christ. So I want to talk a little bit further on circumcision because there's no health reason to, you know, have the foreskin removed according to the American College of Pediatrics. Remember, in many countries in Europe right now, most of the men are not circumcised, except for the Jews. And they don't, don't have an increase of health problems. Uh, for example, I'm from Sweden, and almost all the Swedish men are uncircumcised. Um, sexually transmitted diseases and uncleanness is what causes um, venereal disease. In fact, uncircumcision may have a protective purpose um, and assist with increased sensitivity. Remember that Adam was made perfectly to live forever and he had foreskin. The circumcision of the Jews involves just the top tip of the foreskin and not all of it like in America. Circumcision mm -hmm. was a token of the covenant between God and his nation as it says in Genesis 17.11. Let's go there, Patty. Genesis 17.11. Go ahead and read that, Patty. Okay. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Okay. So, um, it was very important, and, and it says... In verse 14, and the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, and he hath broken my covenant. Hmm. So it was very important to be circumcised in um, Israel's program. Mm -hmm. It was a sign for Israel to trust in God, not their flesh like Abraham had trusted in his flesh when he had Ishmael. Even for Israel, they were to have a circumcision of the heart, but, you know, in the dispensation of grace, we're not under law, we're under grace. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, it is, um, uh, by be believing God's word is what's important. Patty, can you please read verse 19? Uh uh, we're oh, back, back in chapter back. 7, okay. verse 19. We're, we're moving right along. Yeah. We should okay. be done uh, yeah. ahead of schedule today. Okay. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Okay, so here it's not the Ten Commandments. Oh. What is, it's a keeping of the commandment of the Lord is um, obeying God in our Christian walk during this dispensation. Our walk involves understanding Paul's distinctive apostleship and adhering to what the Lord teaches us in the body of Christ through him. So he's, we're, our books are Romans to Philemon. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14.37. Can you read that too, Patty? 1 Corinthians 14.37. And read real loud. Okay. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him not acknowledge, acknowledge that the things that I wrote unto right. you, uh, I write unto you, are the commandments of the Lord. So, hmm. what Paul writes are the commandments of the Lord mm -hmm. in this dispensation of the grace of God. Okay, I'm going to read verse 20. 720 says, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he is called. 
Um, verse 20. So if you're oh. circumcised, stay, you know, circumcised. If you're uncircumcised, don't circumcise yourself. If you're married, stay married. Um, verse 21 says, Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. So if you're called being a servant, um, don't worry about it. But if you're able to be made free, stay a servant. But if you're able to be made free, you know, go for it. Patty, verse 22. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So, believers are to stay where they are when they were saved as far as their socionomic workplace. But if they have an opportunity to improve their, their, your workplace, take it. Servants are free in Christ and free men are his servants. If you are a slave or have an opportunity to be free, take it. That's what Paul says. Servants can marry others in the Lord. There is no socioeconomic prohibition in marriage today. Patty, verse 23. Ye are brought, bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. So, Paul says bought with a price for the second time. Mm -hmm. The first time was in 620. So he says, since Christ has you know, bought you with his precious blood, that we're supposed to serve him. Uh, verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So Paul is reiterating the fact that we are to stay where we're called or where, where we are when we're saved. Verse 25, Patty. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress, I say, that it is good for a man so to be. So there's male virgins and there's female virgins. Okay, so in the present distress is um, what's going on in Corinth, and it's also um, has to do. Oh, we're having some work done in our house, and the dog's going crazy. But we're going to try to ignore the dog and the workman. Okay, so um, the present distress is that Paul is forming the body of Christ. Uh, while there's a lot of opposition to what Paul is doing, but he wants people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, just like we are supposed to be doing today. Um, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. So, if you if your wife leaves you. I mean, if you if you have a wife, don't don't try to get out of the marriage. Stay where you are. And if your marriage, if your wife has left you, don't look for a wife. Is what Paul is saying right there. Mm -hmm. Virgins, male or female, Paul says, let a man remain a virgin. And if you're married, stay that way. If you're unmarried, stay that way. So, in the next dispensation, um, there will be all of those 144 virgins, right? Mm -hmm. Remember those, Patty? Let's turn to um, Revelation 14.14. 14. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14.14. 14. Mm -hmm. you, you can read that, oh, Patty. Okay. Says, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Oh, 
That wasn't it. Oh. <laughs> Let me see. Did I? Um, okay. This is. Um, let me see. I, I was looking for the verse that talks about the the uh, hundred forty-four thousand. Uh, you know, the, from twelve thousand from each tribe. Uh -huh. Let me see where it go. I think I'm warm. Oh, I don't think I know that I think it's 144,000 virgins. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of virgins. Yeah. Uh, okay. There, there we go. There we go. Oh, okay. You got it. Okay. Um, yeah. It's. Um, It's in chapter seven. Okay, so um, verse four. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand, and all of 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 all the tribes of the children of Israel. So those are the, you know, then he goes through the different tribes. I just wanted to see where it said virgins, but there, it says virgins there somewhere. A hundred, oh wait, I know something about that 112,000 from each tribe. tribe. Yeah, but we're, we're not going to uh, uh, wait, uh, you know, spend too much time here. Uh -huh. But um, but they're virgins. They're virgins. Huh. Yeah, they're virgins. Okay, they're male or female? No, they're all male. They're all male virgins. Oh, they're all male yeah. virgins. Okay. Okay. Well, at least I we'll think they're all. Into that. Yeah. So okay. anyway. All right. Well, back um, to. Oh, so, uh, verse twenty-eight, Patty. 28. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you. So if a virgin marries, mm -hmm. then they break their virginity, right? Mm -hmm. They have not sinned. It's, it's fine, mm -hmm. Paul says, if you get married. Yeah. But for the sake of the female, Paul says that she will have trouble in the flesh. Marriage brings responsibilities. Women have so much work to do in the home. No human is able to meet another human's needs completely. Humans are imperfect. So we need to put up with each other. Still, it's nice to have a companion in this life. Um, I, for one, really like being married. Only, but Patty's known me since before I was married. <laughs> and that's been a long time, over 25 years. Only God can meet our every need. The woman was to be a co-regent with Adam in the beginning. In Genesis 128. Let's turn there. Genesis 128. Um, and I'll, I'll read that one. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So, them, being Adam and Eve, they were supposed to have dominion over the earth. They were supposed to be like king and queen. Mm -hmm. um, but because Eve sinned, men rule over women, and we have more pain in childbirth. But Christ has more than undone all that, the harm that Adam did and Eve. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in Romans 5. Grace abounded more. So Christ has undone what Adam, the harm that Adam and Eve did. Still, there is a hierarchy between equals, as we will learn when we get to chapter 11. In the kingdom, Christ will rule with his bride, which is Israel. Okay, verse 29. Uh, Patty, go ahead and read that. But this short it remaineth 
that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Okay, so the time is short. That means that our lifetime is short. Mm -hmm. And he says that um, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none. So it's the present distress right there. Go ahead, mm -hmm. and I'll read verse 30. And they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. So Paul is saying, are you going to let some sorrow or tragedy in your life keep you from serving God? Rejoice. Are you going to let some pleasure in your life take the place of laboring as a son or daughter with God? Will you let your business, so when he says the possessed, mm -hmm. as though they possess not, that has to do with business and finance. Mm -hmm. uh, will you let your business take the place of working for the Lord too? So, Paul wants people to, you know, go out there, win souls, and help people to come to the knowledge of truth. Because that's what God's doing right then, and right now, in this age, for us too. Verse 31, Patty. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world pass the away. So we can enjoy the world but not let the creation take us away from the Creator. Time is short because our lifetimes are short and also because we don't know how long it's going to be until the rapture. We want as many people to get on board the body of Christ as possible. This world is very vain or empty. It's like a fashion show. And Shakespeare, William Shakespeare said this, All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven ages. So basically he's saying that we have 70 years to live. So um, turn to Psalm 90 verse 10. Patty, Psalm 90 verse 10. I'll let you read that. So we have exits and entrances and all the world's a stage. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure that William Shakespeare got it from, from Paul. Mm -hmm. He read Paul. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Okay, so mm. we're going to live 70 to 80 years. Mm. And mm. and then, you know, it, it, it. this is another thing that Shakespeare might have read. Mm -hmm. For our, our life is soon cut off, and we fly away. Our, our soul and mm -hmm. our spirit go back to God, yeah. who gave it. Um, verse 32 in 7, go back to chapter 7, and I'll read 32 and you can read 33. Okay. Um, but I would have you without carefulness. That means without full of care. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Patty, verse 33. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Verse 34. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord. But she may be holy, both in that she may be holy, both in body and, and spirit. But she that is married carried for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So before I was married, I spent hours reading the Bible. And now that I'm married, I still spend hours <laughs> reading the Bible. But um, 
you know, between here and there, I had to do a lot with my husband and my children. I had to care for them. So, um, if you're unmarried, you will care for the things that belong to the Lord, how we can please Him. But the married, whether it's a man or a woman, cares for their spouse and how they can please their spouse. Verse 35, Patty. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Uh, verse 36 says, oh boy, they're really grinding out there. And well, let me wait a second, maybe they'll be quiet. Well, we just have to carry on. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So if a father knows that his daughter has a burning desire to get married, that's need so require. He may make her happy and give his virgin daughter in marriage after she has become of age. That means that she started her cycle. Mm -hmm. Paul speaks for our best interest. Paul does not want us to feel trapped in staying unmarried or, or in staying married. He just says what, that it is best to stay single so that we can serve the Lord without distraction. Jesus said something similar. He said in, um, I'm going to read this, Matthew 19, 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So Paul made himself a eunuch for uh the sake of the body of Christ and for serving the Lord as his minister uh, and apostle to the body of Christ. He, he kept himself single so he could be without distraction in serving the Lord. So verse 37, Patty. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. Okay, so, um, and then verse 38 says, So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. So, but he that with the consent of the daughter, because she does not have a burning desire to marry, uh, and can and she can keep herself, you know, contain herself. He can keep his heart steadfast on the Lord and let her stay a virgin, so that she can keep her her heart steadfast on the Lord too. So the person who kindly allows his daughter to marry does well, but the father that allows his virgin daughter to remain single and serve the Lord does better. That's what it is. Uh, verse 39, Patty. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liber liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Um, Patty, verse 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So, marriage is for life. Um, the wife should stay married till death do you part. If her husband dies, she's free to marry whom she wants, but only to a believer. Mm. So, we're going to look at um, something in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in a minute. Paul says that he has the Spirit of God as he writes and that she is happier if she stays single. 
But notice in this verse where it says that she is at liberty in verse 39 to marry whom she will. That means, you know, she can marry a rich or poor man. She can marry a, a Jew that's a believer. She can marry, you know, a black man. Um, it doesn't matter. Whoever she wants to marry as long as she's marrying in the Lord. That's what it says. So 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do you want me to read this part, Patty? Or do you want to read okay. it? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what con concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So, um, because we are the temple of the living God, we should only marry other believers. So, um, regarding marriage and divorce, though, I, you know, we've, we've just said that, you know, we can marry whoever we believe, uh, we, we want, whoever we will. But, um, we are under grace, and if there's physical abuse in the marriage, or a dangerous activity like drugs and alcohol abuse, or a sexual infidelity that can lead to deadly venereal disease such as AIDS, then the spouse should be able to exit the marriage for their own safety. Christ taught that adultery was grounds for divorce. Even God divorced Israel for a season because of spiritual adultery, and we're going to look at that. But God did not have relations with another group of people during that time, but remained faithful to his people. And he will marry his bride. So um, let's um, take a look at Matthew 19, 7, where the Lord Jesus Christ says that, um, you know, Moses said that they could get a, a divorce. Verse Matthew nineteen seven, Patty. They say unto him, Why did Moses then give to uh, command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Patty, try not to sure. kick that. Okay, Sorry. read verse eight. He saith unto them, Moses, be Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Okay. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doeth, doth commit adultery. So, um, fornication was grounds for um, a divorce. So let's now look at Jeremiah. We're almost done. We only have a couple of verses and then we'll be finished. Jeremiah mm -hmm. 3, 8. We're talking now about God divorcing Israel. Jeremiah 3, 8. Go ahead and read that when you find it, Patty. Okay. Wow. But then he said, that was not so. In the beginning. Um, yeah, so it wasn't so when he originally made Adam and Eve perfectly, uh -huh. that a man should cleave to his wife when they were in the perfect innocent stage uh -huh. before sin entered the world. Okay, so 3, 8, Patty. Okay? And, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce 
Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot, harlot also. Okay, so God spends a lot of time talking about how Israel and Judah were both harlots because they had spiritual adultery against the Lord. So he gave uh, Israel a bill of divorcement and had them go into Assyria, uh, be mm-hmm. captured by those people. But Judah didn't, wasn't paying attention and uh, straightening up. But they, they became even worse in in uh, mm-hmm. in Judah than than in Israel. So is um, let's. Uh, so he um, divorced, he gave a bill of divorcement, God gave a bill of divorcement to Israel in that verse. Now let's go to Isaiah 50 verse 1. Go ahead, Patty. Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Okay, so he's saying here that, um, you know, I, I didn't divorce you, but... Because you're of your iniquities, you, I, you put yourself, you divorced, you you know, me, yourselves, basically is what he's saying. Oh. And for your transgression is your mother put away, your mother being Israel. So, mm-hmm. he, in, the, in the end, he did divorce Israel for, for a time. Mm-hmm. Okay, but God is and did not have relations, like I said, with another group of people during that time. He stayed, he kept himself pure with his people waiting for them. And um, so let's now look at Revelation 19.7 and 21.9. And these, uh, we'll close with these two verses. Um, Patty, why don't you read uh, Revelation 19.7. And I'll do 21 lines. We really miss Maureen when she's not here. Uh, Go ahead, Patty. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Okay. So there. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is going to have his um, marriage and his wife has made herself ready and in 21 9 and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And in verse 10 it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Mm -hmm. Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, um, clear as crystal, and um, had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates at the gates, twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And the east, Uh, On the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in the name, and the, and in the name, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So, you know, the, the, the twelve foundations were named after the twelve apostles. 
And the 12 gates were, were from the, the names of the 12 tribes. So in the tw tw those 12 is the number for Israel. There's, it doesn't say that one of the foundations or one of the gates was named after the body of Christ. Oh. It's all Israel. It's all about Israel. Mm. And we know that Hebrews through Revelation is a, those verses, I mean, those um, books are for Israel to help them through the tribulation period. So that ends our study. Let's end with a word of a prayer. Dear Lord, um, thank you for your word, Lord Jesus, and for um, this time of study in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, you don't finish. Blue. Press the blue. Blue? Whatever is blue. I don't see anything. Okay. I'll, I'll just press finish. Okay. <laughs>